How's everybody feeling politically? <laughs> Pretty good. How are you feeling physically? Cold? I think that a good solution for the cold is to cuddle <laughs> with anybody. Um, okay, up next, uh, I want to introduce Malik Gaines and Alejandro Segade. Malik and, Malik and Alejandro are artists based in New York. Since 2000, they have performed and exhibited extensively with their collective, My Barbarian, whose show, The Audience is Always Right, is currently on view at the New Museum. They make solo and duo projects as well. They are going to come up individually and um, Malik will begin. Please welcome Malik Gaines. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Zoe and everybody. I learned a political speech recently. Uh, Josephine Baker made a unusual trip to the United States to attend the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. And she uh, wore a little suit skirt, like a cute little suit skirt thing with all of her significant medals that she had been awarded, awarded by France for her work with the French resistance. And she spoke before the official program. And she said, friends, you know I have lived a long time and I have come a long way. And you know that the things I did, I did originally for myself. And as these things began happening to me, I started to wonder if they were happening to you too. And then I knew they must be. And I knew you could not defend yourselves the way I could. And as I continued to do the things I did and say the things I said, they began to beat me. Not beat me, mind you, with a club, <laughs> but you know I have seen that done too. But they beat me with their pens, with their writings, and friends, that is much worse. When I was a child and they burned me out of my home, I was frightened and I ran away. Eventually, I ran far away to a place called France. Many of you have been there and many have not. But I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in that country I never feared. To me it was like a fairyland place. And I need not tell you that wonderful things happened to me there. Now, I know all you children don't know who Josephine Baker is, but you ask grandma and grandpa and they will tell you. You know what they will say. Why, she was a devil. And you know why they are right, I was too. I was a devil in other countries and I was a little devil in America too. But when I was young in Paris, strange things happened to me and these things had never happened to me before. When I left St. Louis a long time ago, the conductor directed me to the last car and you know what that means. But when I ran away, yes, ran away to another country, I didn't have to do that. I could eat in any restaurant I wanted to, and I could drink water any place I wanted to, and I didn't have to go to a colored toilet either. And I have to tell you, I got used to it, and it was nice, and I liked it. And I wasn't afraid that someone was going to shout at me and say, nigger, go to the end of the line. But you know I rarely ever used that word. You also know it has been shouted at me many times. So over there, far away, I was happy, and because I was happy, I had some success, and you know that too. Then after a long while, I came to America to be in a great show for Mr. Zigfield, and you know Josephine was happy, you know that, because I wanted to tell everyone in my country about myself. I wanted to show that I had made good, and you know too that that is only natural. But on that great, big, beautiful ship, I had a bad experience. A very important star was to sit with me for dinner, and at the last moment, I discovered that she didn't want to eat with a colored woman. I can tell you it was some blow, and I'm not going to mention her name now because it doesn't matter, and anyway, she's dead. 
And when I got to New York, way back then, there were other blows. When they wouldn't let me check into the good hotels because I was colored or eat in certain restaurants. And then I went to Atlanta, and it was a horror to me. And I thought, my God, I am Josephine. If this is how they treat me, how do they treat the other people in America? You know, friends, I do not lie when I tell you I have walked into the palaces of kings and queens and into the houses of presidents and much more. But I could not walk into a hotel in America and get a cup of coffee, and that made me mad. And when I get mad, I open my big mouth. And when Josephine opens her mouth, then look out, because they hear it all over the world. So I did open my mouth, and I did scream out. And when I demanded what I was supposed to have and what I was entitled to, they still would not give it to me. So then they thought they could smear me. And the best way to do that was to call me a communist. And you know, too, what that meant. Those were dreaded words in those days. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I was hounded by the government agencies in America, and there was never one ounce of proof that I was a communist. But they were mad. They were mad because I told the truth. And the truth was, all I wanted was a cup of coffee. But I wanted that cup of coffee where I wanted to have it, and I had enough money to pay for it, so why shouldn't I have it? My friends and brothers and sisters, this is how it went. And when I screamed out, they started to open the door a little bit, and we all started to be able to squeeze through. Not just the colored people, but the others as well, the other minorities too, the Orientals and the Mexicans and the Indians, both those here in the United States and those from India. Now, I'm not going to stand in front of you all today and take credit for what is happening here now. I cannot do that. But I do want to take credit for telling you how to do the same. And when you scream out, you will be heard, and you will be heard now. But you young people must do one thing. And I know you have heard the story a thousand times from your mothers and fathers, the way I heard it from my mama. I didn't take her advice, but I accomplished the same in another fashion. You must get an education. You must go to school, and you must learn to protect yourselves. And you must learn to protect yourselves with the pen and not the gun. Then you can answer them. And I can tell you, and I don't wish to sound corny, but ladies and gentlemen, the pen really is mightier than the sword. I am not a young woman. Most of my life is behind me. I don't have that much fire left burning inside of me. And before it goes out, I want you to take what's left and light that fire in you so that you can carry on and so that you can do the things that I have done. And then when my fire goes out and I go where we all must go someday, I can be happy. You know, I always took the rocky path. I never took the easy one. But as I grew older and as I knew I had the strength and the power, I took that rocky path and I tried to smooth it out a little bit. I wanted to make it easier for you. I wanted for you what I had. And mothers and fathers, if it is too late for you, think of your children. Make it safe here so they do not have to run away. For I want for you and your children what I had. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, I have just been handed a little note, as you probably say. It is an invitation to visit the President of the United States in his home, the White House. I am greatly honored. I must tell you that a colored woman, or as you say here in America, a black woman, is not going there. It is a woman. It is Josephine Baker. It is a great honor for me. I want someday for all of your children to have that honor too. And we know that that time is not someday, that time is now. I thank you, and may God bless you, and may he continue to bless you long after I am gone. Thank you, Malik. <laughs> uh, thank you, Zoe. Thanks, everyone. Um, 
I'm going to read something I've never read before. Um, this is a, an entry from a memoir <laughs> that I'm working on. Um, Malik and I, you just saw Malik, um, have been together 25 years uh, this year. Um, and so uh, I decided to write uh, memories of the sex we've had over the last 25 years. One entry for each year. Um, so there'll be 25 entries, 25 years of sex, a quarter century of sex. Uh, this is the July 1992 um, entry to answer Morgan's questions. <laughs> Malik was coming to visit me in San Diego that first summer after starting UCLA. In the three quarters that comprised the school year, I had gone through major transformations. I did drugs, went to raves, shaved my head, pierced my nose, turned gay. I first came out to Karen and Jennifer, my friends from freshman orientation, and with them had imagined who my boyfriend would be. A queer nation activist, sullen, with tattooed arms, a goatee, pierced nipples, a go-go boy at Club Fuck who listened to Industrial and lived on the east side and made underground movies. But then, one rainy night in the dorms, I met Malik. And now he was coming to see my family home, sleep over in my childhood bedroom. Malik pulled up in his new red Mazda, Annie Lennox singing Why and him singing along, just like in the dorms, listening to Annie touching each other's dicks in the dark bottom bunk. Malik's straight roommate, Jean, teased us that we made him feel lonely. We tried not to shake the bed too much. Malik politely answered my parents' questions with a freckle-faced smile. He dressed in the uniform of a gay boy who worked at The Gap. White buttoned shirt tucked into red jeans with a black leather belt matching Doc Martens. Malik was the boyfriend material my parents wanted for me. A combination of safe, meaning my age and clean cut and healthy looking, and interesting, meaning from another academic family. All four of our parents were teachers, liberal-minded intellectuals who had married people from other racial groups, who now had to figure out how to deal with having gay sons, something they weren't always good at. When I had first come out to my folks, over a payphone on campus, my persistent allergies made them think I had a cold, which made them think I was dying. Now it was summer, and Malik's sunny temperament put them at ease. My mom noted that with him around, I had better manners. The conversation during dinner at a fish restaurant overlooking the water had a pointed subtext, that we should be monogamous, settle down at 17, and survive the crisis, huddled together under a blanket, naked if need be, but alive. The phrases, I'm gay and I have AIDS, difficult to untether in their contemporary imaginary. When we got home, my parents went to bed and Malik and I were alone in my room. I had painted the walls dark red in my senior year of high school and put up posters of Kate Bush and the green-haired anime character Eve from Megazone 2-3. <laughs> My bed was too small for both of us to sit on, so we piled blankets on the carpet, and in underwear and t-shirts, I watched him roll a tight, elegant joint. What my parents did not know about Malik is that he was just getting out of a relationship with a 28-year-old who had been his boss. His apartment was so weird, he said, licking his finger and touching spit to the glowing end, controlling its burn. A framed Marilyn Monroe poster on the floor and practically no furniture, bare, off-white walls, something was wrong with him. I inhaled, my eyes fixing on Malik's striped Calvin Klein boxers. In the dim light of the red room, I thought about how much I wanted to lay my face on that warm cotton. One thing about Paul, though, he said, breaking the, the lull, is he taught me some things. He liked to rim me. I didn't know what that was, do you? I had read accounts of rim jobs in my father's penthouse magazines, but as often happens in moments of imminent sex, I was speechless. Lay on your back, he said, 
and lift your legs. I saw my underwear tossed across the room. Malik held my ankles wide apart, bending my spine into a curve. You'll like this, he whispered. His hands ran down my calves. He placed my hand on my dick. I felt a quick lick like someone tasting someone else's ice cream. He pulled away, and I felt his cool breath before his tongue came back, prodding. The cum spurted across my stomach. His face between my legs, he wiped his mouth. Standing above me, he turned around. I grabbed his butt, stuck my face in deep. He pressed against my face as I sank back onto the carpet, my head under his ass. Breathing in, I fucked him with my mouth. His balls bouncing on my chin and ex exhaling loudly, he spurted all over me, driveling onto my happy trail when I stood up to kiss him. Uh, he said, pushing me away, laughing. You've just had your face in my butt. Using his underwear, he cleaned me up slowly and then fell quickly asleep. I lay down on the floor watching him, certain my parents had heard. I was a little worried, wondering if what we had just done was safe, imagining that two gay bodies, when rubbed together, could spontaneously produce disease. I remembered that the safe sex brochure they passed out at the Gay Lesbian Alliance suggested you cut a condom in half, put it between your butt cheeks, and lick that if you wanted oral anal contact. How pointless that precaution seemed, holding him against me, the taste of each other in our mouths. Then, as now, I knew, as I know now, that whenever together we were, we are safe. Thanks. <laughs>